welcome to Watch for the Signs. My name is Jared. Let's take a look at Russia and Ukraine and what's going on now. There's a few big things actually uh, coming out today. So we're going to be talking about this evacuation of Kurzon, which is one of the the provinces that you that Russia um, claims to have annexed. Uh, there was a UN vote condemning Russia and rejecting the annexation. Uh, there's going to be nuclear drills, both by NATO and by Russia. Um, and then uh, NATO, or sorry, not NATO, the European Union is going to be training Ukrainian troops. So th there's more to it. Than th there's a lot of details, but this is the basic overview of what's going on here. Okay, so let's start with Kurzon. Okay, where is Kurzon? Let's take a look at this. We'll go to this map. Kurzon is this well let me let me zoom out let's see find the best one i guess let's look at this one <clears throat> here we go curzon oblast it's this region right here okay okay so this is where this is taking place it's both this region and the name of its capital city is curzon Okay, same name. And as you can see, uh, Ukrainian forces have taken these blue areas and they're making their way to the capital city of Kurzon. Um, I wanted to see just how far away they were. And so I went to Google Maps and it turns out that if you take that, that main highway from the closest um, town that's currently under Ukrainian control, it's only about 36 minutes away by free, by freeway, okay, or by by driving. So they are pretty close to the capital city. Okay, so Russia to evacuate civilians from occupied region as Ukraine advances. Um, that's kind of a crazy thing if they're talking about the entire region, right? I mean, think about the United States or whatever country you're from. If one of your provinces or states were entirely evacuated uh, because of war, that's that's pretty insane, isn't it? Um, okay, the Russian-installed leader of Ukraine's southern Kurzon region, Vladimir Saldo, has called on civilians to evacuate, citing daily rocket attacks by advancing Ukrainian forces. He urged them to, quote-unquote, save themselves by going to Russia for quote unquote leisure and study. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure if I would be it'd be a very um leisurely time as you leave your your home and wars going on. But whatever, okay. Uh the call was later echoed by Russian Deputy Minister Prime Minister Marat Kusnulin uh, in a message on state television. Its troops have recently retaken some areas of northwestern Kurzon, closing in on the regional capital. Uh, talking about Ukraine. So that's what we were just looking at. And uh, that's something that we're going to have to keep our, our eye on. That's really, really close. Only a 36-minute drive from Kurzon to right here. Uh, Posad Pokrovsky. That's very, very close. Um, yeah. Okay. Quote, the government took the decision to organize assistance for the departure of residents of the Kurzon region to other regions of the country, said Mr. Kusnulin, uh, who, was special, who has special responsibility for southern Russia and Crimea. Quote, we will provide everyone with free accommodation and everything necessary. So, I mean, I guess at least there's that because if someone told me that, I'm here in Kansas, if someone was like, okay, uh, everyone in Kansas, you need to leave, go somewhere else for safety, don't, I'd be like, well, I don't really have money for that. So it looks like they're going to take care of it, uh, hopefully. Anyway, among other weaponry, uh, Kiev has been using, using U.S. supplied HIMARS rocket systems. I should have pulled that up just as a reminder in case I have new people watching rocket system military today. I like to 
go to this website right here. These are relatively new, entered service in 2005, and in, in military years, that's like pretty new. So this has been a key weapon system for Ukraine. <clears throat> Let's say it's been a big problem for Russia. Okay. So among other weaponry, Kiev has been using U.S.-supplied HIMARS rocket systems to great effect, targeting key Russian-held military targets and threatening to cut off the bulk of the occupying forces on the west bank of the Dnieper River, known as Dnipro in Ukraine. Kurzon is the only regional capital seized by Russian forces since Moscow's invasion began on the 24th of February. So if you'll recall, uh, when this all initially broke out, you had Luhansk and Donetsk that had already, I guess those that wanted to join uh, Russia had essentially taken control of those regions and uh, they claimed that they had declared independence and Russia recognized their independence. I don't remember that being say, said about Zaporizhia, which is down here. So I'm not, I don't know. But so that's why that's the case. So these had already been taken by separatists uh, with the help of Russia. So Russia technically, since the invasion, has not have, has not taken these. Um, the only one out of the four is Kurzon right here. And Ukraine is pretty darn close to Kurzon. Okay. Other major developments on Thursday. All of Ukraine, with the exception of Crimea, was for some time under uh, air raid alert. And Russian missile strikes were reported on energy and military targets in the Kiev region and Lviv in the west. Yes. Let's go back to our map right here. Okay. So Lviv. Oh, I was thinking that it was over here. No, it's right here. Lviv. Here's Lviv. So let's click on this. Explosions were reported in Lviv five hours ago from the time of this recording. I'm recording this at 1.30 central time. So there's one, and then this one four hours ago, two missiles hit a military object in Zolokiv district in Lviv region. One was shot down by air defense. So Russia is striking over here. Okay. Um, let's see, you have these like air defense icons. Air defense shot down missiles near Vin Vinitsia and in Odessa region. Here's one right here. Five hours ago, MLRS shelling reported in South Kiriviri district all the way over here. Air defense was active in Chernivtsi region. All right. So uh, this is interesting because you remember that. Okay. So what happened was Ukraine successfully bombed a bridge right here, this bridge between Crimea and mainland Russia. It didn't take out the bridge, but it damaged it. It took out like half of it. Well, not, okay, when I say half, there's a portion of it where there were two lanes that were taken out. And then on the other side, another two lanes that were still kind of intact, but wobbly. So in response, Russia had um, attacked, you know, Kiev and other places hitting um, civilian targets, infrastructure, and stuff like that. And so with this happening right now, it's almost like it's still kind of happening, right? It's still kind of happening. Um, two people were killed in shelling in, in the southern city of uh, Mykolaiv, and dramatic footage showed a young boy being rescued from the rubble of a destroyed house there. Let's, let's see where that's at. Miko Live. Um, how do I close out of that? Okay. Miko Live. Miko Live Oblast. So not too far from Curzon. Let's look at it on the on the map over here. 
oh yeah there you go this kind of shows it in a better uh context so it's it's just behind it's behind these uh ukrainian lines right here so Kurzon's over here miko live is over there all right both kiev and moscow confirmed that uh, 20 Ukrainian service personnel were exchanged for 20 Russian soldiers in the latest such swap. Okay, let's move on. Okay, NPR. Only four countries side with Russia as UN rejects annexations in Ukraine. Um, the UN General Assembly roundly rejected Russia's move to illegally annex four regions of Ukraine, with only four countries voting alongside President Vladimir Putin's regime. Ukrainian President uh, Vladimir Zelensky says the world had its say. Um, he expressed his gratitude, a message he issued in seven languages. He called Russia's push for annexation worthless, quote unquote, saying free nations will never recognize it. Here is a chart of everyone and how they voted. So as you can see here, red uh, in favor of Russia, Belarus, uh, North Korea, Nicaragua, Russia itself, and then Syria. And then yellow are abstinations. Um, let's see, Algeria, Armenia, Bolivia, Burundi, a lot of these seem to be kind of like third world countries. Uh, there's China, um, Cuba, there are a lot of African countries, Honduras, like Central, South American countries. See Pakistan, South Africa, da 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 da. All right. Only Belarus and Nicaragua joined Syria and North Korea to go on the record opposing the resolution that calls on countries to not recognize. Russia's claim on the Ukrainian regions. Both China and Cuba, two longtime Russian allies, abstained from Wednesday's vote, maintaining the positions they've taken on Ukraine related measures since Russia launched its full scale attack in February. Other countries abstaining include India, which has relied on Russia for a large share of its oil needs, and many nations in Africa where grain from Russia and Ukraine is a key commodity. And I'm sure that's the case with uh, those other countries too, like Bolivia. Um, I don't know the intricacies of Bolivian-Russian relations, but it's probably something along those lines. Uh, breaking. The United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution that condemns hashtag Russia's quote-unquote illegal so-called referendums uh, in regions with hashtag Ukraine's internationally recognized borders and demand it reverses its annexation declaration. So uh, do, do you guys think that Russia is going to take that seriously? That they're going to be like, oh, man, OK, we lost the vote. All that work for nothing. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, you know, I, I was reading an article. I, I couldn't find it again, but there was an article yesterday that was talking about this as as this United Nations voting thing was going on and i guess the u.s had like really lobbied with a bunch of different countries trying to get them to vote against russia and it's like who cares like what what does this vote even do i mean it like it, it sets it, okay so it goes on the record for the united nations and i guess essentially the benefit of this and correct me if i'm wrong or if or if my opinion is incomplete but or maybe they're they're like trying to set the stage for history so that later on when history is written, it's like, well, yeah, the whole world was against Russia, uh, you know, just to like, I, I don't know, but it's clearly not going to stop Russia and not going to change their mind about the annexation, right? It's kind of just like all these countries being like, hey, that's not right. What else does it do aside from that? Don't know. Don't know. Okay, now the nuclear drills. NATO chief warns Russia not to cross very important line. Brussels. Russian President Russian President Vladimir Putin would be crossing a quote-unquote very important line 
if he were to order the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg warned Thursday. As both the military alliance and Russia are due to hold nuclear exercises in the next few days. And this has me wondering because, okay, so even though it's something that they both do typically, um, I think on an annual basis, Russia, before it invaded Ukraine, if you'll remember, claimed that it was doing military exercises as like all these troops were amassing along the um the the eastern border of ukraine he had all these russian troops that were piling up right here and at the time russia was like oh don't worry about it it's just military exercises these were these were scheduled and i think everyone kind of knew better although no one really knew what was going to happen if if russia would actually do this or not because you know, they, everyone realized that if they did that, this would be the largest conventional war in Europe since World War II. I myself, I was really on the fence whether they would do it or not. I, I kind of doubted that they would. Uh, it seems so surreal, but they did. And so this isn't necessarily the same situation, but could could Russia do the same thing? with their nuclear drills could they be like no this is our that you know that we do this every year but this time they're like a oh, surprise i i don't know maybe that'd be dumb as nato is running their nuclear drills but i don't know i'm not an expert okay nato is holding its exercises dubbed steadfast noon uh next week the long plan maneuvers are conducted around the same time every year and run for about one week. They involve fighter jets, fighter jets capable of carrying nuclear warheads, uh, but do not involve any live bombs. Russia usually holds its own maneuvers around the same time, and NATO is expecting Moscow's exercise, exercise of its nuclear forces sometime this month. Stoltenberg said NATO will, clo- will quote unquote closely monitor what Russia is up to. Well, I, I hope so. I hope so. There's been a lot of nuclear talk, and I think that we should take them seriously. And um, again, I feel like it'd probably be uh, not smart on their part if they if they use these exercises to carry out a strike, but maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, ask what NATO would... Okay, ask what NATO would do if Russia launched a nuclear attack. Stoltenberg said, quote, we will not go into exactly how we will respond, but of course this will be fundamentally, this will fundamentally change the nature of the conflict. It will mean that a very important line has been crossed. Uh, And then he added, even any use of smaller nuclear weapon, of a smaller nuclear weapon, will be a very serious thing, fundamentally changing the nature of the war in Ukraine, and of course that would have consequences. Well, what kind of consequences? I know I know that you don't want to say, but I, I kind of have my doubts what the consequences would be if Russia used a nuclear bomb. Um, it feels like it would just be more sanctions and, you know, things like that. Um, what, what did, what did uh, Iran do, by the way? Let's see. Iran... Uh, Iran, it's just, it's black. Is that because they're not allowed to vote or something like that? Venezuela is black. Um, Azerbaijan is black. Does anyone know why these countries have black? Are they not allowed to vote or are they suspended or something like that? Because they're not under abstination. Um, In one of my last videos, we were talking about Iran because there's these... uh, protests that are going on right now and one thing that russia has been concerned about is um let's see let me pull this up you uh iran protest map there should be one for a live ua map so there's been these protests going on in iran russia 
as part of this entire thing that's going on right now, they've been concerned that the United States and the West are using a strategy called color revolutions, which would have been responsible for the Arab Spring, where you had a bunch of governments overthrown. Other countries experienced other things, like, for example, in Syria right now, they're still dealing with that. They're still in a state of civil war. And now uh, things seem to be kind of picking up in Iran. Don't know. I don't know if it's a color revolution, but it's interesting that this is happening at a time when Russia is doing this. Now, I, I know that this kind of extended back into 2021 before the invasion, and uh, primarily they were protesting um, power outages and I think water shortages. I need to look this up again. Okay. 2021 Iranian protests. Here we go. Wikipedia. I want to see. Okay. So it had pretty much been that. So they're dating this as uh, July 2021. So this is when these kind of started. But it took a new turn right here. Okay. September of 2022. September 2022. uh, This girl right here, Masa Amini, was killed. And uh, the, the belief of the protesters is that uh, she, she was arrested by <clears throat> the, the, uh, the guidance patrol, or in other words, the, the like religious police, uh, for not wearing her hijab or not wearing it correctly. And uh, she died while in custody. And there are those that say that she was beaten, although they, it, it seems like they try to cover it up and say, no, she had a heart attack. Um, I don't know, you know, obviously I don't have all the details, but that's, that's what has really kind of picked up, uh, or has kind of accelerated, it seems, these protests. So it was already kind of simmering, right? And then it kind of picked up and now oil workers in Iran are joining and it's, that's really up the antes even more. So the, the whole point I'm trying to make here is I wonder if in response to Russia, because this happened in September, so this is recent. I wonder if somehow, if um, the West could be stoking that, uh, because you know Iran and Russia they they get along well. Um, where is Iran? It's down here. They don't border Russia, but they are ge- they are ge- geographically close, and they share um, the coastline of the Caspian Sea. So anyway, there are there, I know that there's things that NATO and the West could do, um, but I, I highly doubt that they would ever go to war with Russia over this if they used a nuclear bomb. Uh, continuing on, NATO as an organization doesn't possess any weapons. The nuclear weapons nominally, nominally linked to the alliance remain under the firm control of three member states or three member countries, the U.S., the U.K., and France. But France insists on maintaining its nuclear independence and doesn't take part in nuclear planning group meetings. As his war plans have gone uh, awry, Putin has repeatedly signaled that he could resort to nuclear weapons to protect Russian gains. The threat is also aimed at deterring NATO nations from sending more sophisticated weapons to Ukraine. And, uh, and by the way, they, Germany has said that they would send some, um, and the United States, I believe, if I remember right. And then on top of that, we just read that uh, the European Union is going to be doing, they're going to be uh, offering training for Ukrainian military personnel. In an interview with France 2 Television, France, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron suggested that France would not respond with a nuclear strike. He also warned about the responsibilities of leaders when it comes to nuclear rhetoric and said he has spoken to Putin, quote unquote, several times. Quote, we have a nuclear doctrine, which is very clear. The dissuasion is working. (sighs) Yeah, I mean, okay, I I don't know. Okay, I don't know. But is it? I I guess we'll see. Uh, But then the less we talk about it, the less we brandish the threat and 
uh, we brandish the threat, the more credible we are. Too many people are talking about it, he said. Well, that's that's all fine and dandy. Um, I question whether whether you've successfully what was it that you said? You've calmed it down. The dissuasion is working. I hope so, Macron. I hope so. I kind of doubt that. Here's a few other bullet points. Um, recent things happen to do it. So mis- Russian missiles continue to pummel Ukraine as the civilian toll rises. Uh, moving to preserve Russia's hold over European energy, Putin offers to sell more gas to or via Turkey. Uh, the European Union plans to launch a mission to train Ukrainian soldiers on European soil. We're going to read about that in just a second. NATO Secretary General says the alliance will back Ukraine as long as it takes. Ukraine's electrical infrastructure is damaged in Russia's strikes. Um, a strike outside Kiev adds to concerns over Russia's use of kamikaze drones. And by the way, I should have pulled this up. Russia orders drones because i think a number has actually come up recently yeah right here two days ago russia orders 2400 shahed kamikaze drones from iran so this is one of the weapons this is one of the weapons that they've been using okay the ukrainian air force reported that 13 Iranian-made kamikaze drones were shot down in Ukraine on the 11th of October. That was two days ago. Anyway, they've ordered 2,400. Okay. Now, the European Union plans to launch a mission to train Ukrainian soldiers on on European soil. There's a few interesting things here about this. Brussels, in, in a first mission of its kind, okay, in a first mission of its kind, the European Union plans to train Ukrainian soldiers on European Union soil, the bloc's top diplomat said on Thursday. A significant move that highlights the bloc's increased security cooperation since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The mission is set for final approval on Monday during a meeting of European Union foreign ministers in Luxembourg. The, dipl- the diplomat <clears throat> Joseph Borrell Fontelles Fonte- said, Quote, at the moment when Putin is increasing escalation, we have in turn uh, we have in turn to continue to support Ukraine as much as needed and for how long it is needed, he said during a meeting of NATO defense ministers in Brussels. The European Union maintains military training missions in uh, the Central African Republic, Mali, Mozambique, and Somalia. But this would be the first time trainers from the bloc would help soldiers on European Union soil. So in other words, the training camps are there in those countries. This would be the first time that they have training camps within uh, their homeland, you know, their, their territory, European Union territory. The new mission, which has been championed by Poland and other European Union nations near Ukraine, has been under negotiation for weeks. Some member states hesitated out of fear that the mission would increase the risk of becoming embroiled in the war, diplomat said, but eventually relented. Yeah. You have to wonder you have to wonder how long uh how long Putin's going to take it. Let's go here. How long is he going to take it because Ukraine is being supplied by the U.S. with the HIMARS systems and financial aid and things like that in other countries. And now they're going to be offering military training on their soil. Um, You know, it it seems like it's just going to continue. And then also the air defense um, military equipment that's being offered by Germany. And I'm sure there's a whole lot more that I'm not aware of. Essentially, like the West is currently fighting Russia, just not directly, but they're supplying the fight. They're helping Russia's enemy. So I just, I wonder how long this can go. Okay. The mission to take place over two years will aim to give thousands of Ukrainian and 
Ukrainians intensive training. Diplomats said that would include trauma work, sniper skills, and handling weapon systems being pledged by Western allies. So, okay, here's here's some nice equipment for you to use, and this is how you use it. Details of the operation are expected to be finalized by mid-November. Uh, officials and diplomats said Poland and Germany are set to take leading roles, with one likely scenario being a headquarters in Poland and senior command or additional centers in Germany. So as we look at the map, that's just right over here. So here's Ukraine, Poland borders Ukraine, and then Germany. Germany is just one more country over. So, all right. I think that's actually, I think that's actually it. I don't think there was much from the Institute of the Study of War. Institute for the Study of War. Let's see. Let's just read the takeaways. Russia is intensifying efforts to set information conditions to falsely portray Ukraine as a terrorist state to deflect recent calls to designate Russia as a terrorist state. I mean, clearly, I mean, who cares? <laughs> if the United Nations voted uh, this way right here, like overwhelmingly against Russia and its annexation of those territories, what does it just, what does it even matter? I guess it matters. I guess it matters, but I don't know. Russian forces may have imported Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps um, affiliated personnel to uh, to occupied areas in Ukraine to train Russian troops in the use of the Shahed-136 drones. If you don't remember what those look like, let me just pull it up. Military Today. I thought that Military Today had a picture of them. I guess we can just go to Wikipedia. I think that's what we did last time, actually. Well, whatever. They're like delta-shaped drones. For some reason, it's not showing here. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Russian sources claim that Ukrainian troops continued counteroffensive operations toward... Okay, I'm not going to get into that detailed into it. Uh, the Russian military continues to face problems equipping individual Russian soldiers with basic personal equipment. Yeah, that's been an issue for a little while now. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's going to be it for this one. So, some interesting things happening. Uh, I don't know how concerned to be about these upcoming nuclear drills, but I guess there's a potential that maybe something will happen. Uh, let's take a look at this. These airplane icons. Seven hours ago, two Ukrainian planes crashed in Poltava region. And then there's another one here close by. A Ukrainian Su-24MR uh, dedicated tactical reconnaissance aircraft crashed in the vicinity of Shaisheki, Poltava Oblast yesterday, was shot down by a missile after combat task in eastern Ukraine, pilots ejected. Can we look at that? What's a Su-24MR? What is that? What is that? It's this thing right here. Entered service in 1973, Soviet Union. The Su-24 remains a powerful long-range, low-level strike attack aircraft with real all-weather precision attack capability. All right. So one of those were shot down, and here it is right here. What's this? Two minutes ago, Kharkiv, red alert, aerial threat, siren sounding, take cover now. What's this lightning bolt? Uh, blackouts in several districts of Kharkiv as, re as a result of Russian shelling. Okay, what's this one? A few seconds ago, Russian army shelling Nikopol. All right, so right now there's some stuff going on right here. And the shelling, where would that be coming from? I guess from over here? From, like, Russian territory? 
because it looks like this is Ukrainian land right here. And then there's st some stuff going on up here. Here's Bolograd. Um, I think I saw something earlier. What's this? Damage to residential buildings in Bolograd after missile launches. So Ukraine is attacking Russian territory. Unexploded Panzer uh, projectile crashed at the ter at the territory of a school in Belgrade. That is a frightening sight right there. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, more explosions reported over Belgrade. Big fire near sugar plant. What's this? Governor Belgrade region. Governor of Bulagrad region confirmed ammunition depot exploded. So that was a sex successful hit for, uh, by the Ukrainians on Russian soil. What's up here? Damage to substation at Popova, Popovo Lezichi village of Kur Kursk region as a result of shelling. Here's the prisoner swap. Right here, we read about that earlier. 20 for 20. Let's see, you, uh, Kiev, what's this? Six hours ago, this chip from KH-101 ALCM, which tried to hit uh, Klitschko Bridge on October 10th, was made in March 2019, i.e. the missile was even newer. As a rule, the oldest things are used up first. Okay, so in other words, yeah, so it says here, the production is three missiles a month. Uh, means Russia has only a few dozen KH-101s left. Okay, so evidence that they're running out of whatever that is. Military today, let's see if they have that. Um, Air-launched cruise missile. Not sure when it entered service exactly. In the late 1980s, Soviets were looking for a new air-launched cruise missile to replace their KH-55. Okay, so anyway, it's a it's a the Russian KH-101 stealthy cruise missile um, is a long-range standoff weapon. Okay. Um, where to go? Where to go? Okay, so there's that. And what's this right here in Kiev? Two minutes ago, the decision to conduct a covert mobilization in Belarus has been made. Sources tell Belarusian outlet Nasha Neva. The decision to conduct a covert mobilization in Belarus. What does that mean? If I find out more about that, I'll let you know what's up here. This is in Belarus. Two minutes ago. Oh, it's the same thing. Okay. Whatever. So that's probably good enough for now. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.